Hello, everyone, and good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Or maybe I could I, I should say Lo de Dien because that that covers the AM PM perhaps a little bit better. Minya uh, Zavut Andrei. Um, that is the extent of the Russian I'll be using today because it's extremely rusty. I, I took it uh, in a previous century, uh, studied some Russian. But I am uh, Andres Martinez. I'm the editorial director of Future Tense. I'm a professor of practice at our Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University. Welcome everyone. Future Tense, as you may know, is a collaboration between Arizona State University, the New America Think Tank, and Slate Magazine. Um, and we're here to talk about uh, an incredibly important, timely topic. And I'm extremely grateful that um, we have uh, uh, experts who are incredibly busy who are, have taken the time to, to talk to us today. Um, we've entitled this the Special Military Operation on Russia's Internet and want, really want to talk about um, you know, the current situation in terms of what is happening uh, with Russians' access to information um, the state of, of, you know, internet is a broad term. We're, we're really wanting to talk about how people are engaging with information and news and each other on social media, as well as more traditional media and looking at, at this landscape. Um, so we there are lots of people in New America doing fascinating work on, on cyber warfare and looking at um, the situation in Ukraine. Um, and elsewhere, but today we really wanted to focus in on, on what's happening um, within Russia and how this, this, this campaign, these events are uh, playing out on, on the Russian digital space and, and what lasting impacts um, they might have. And so for that, I can't think of a, of a better group of people to talk to today. Uh, Taisia uh, Bekulatova is the editor-in-chief of Holod Media. Um, and she also uh, has experience as a correspondent with uh, Medusa, uh, another Russian outlet that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, Yana Pasheva is a um, uh, a good friend, really. I, sh I should I should say as a disclaimer for starters, because she was a Humphrey Fellow at the, our Cronkite School of Journalism in 2020 to 2021. That cohort, Humphrey Fellowship, is a great program where people. Um, uh, really talented journalists come to the Cronkite School from all over the world, um, and it's a fantastic program. And, and our school was was very much enriched by having um, Yana in our community. So, and Ben Dalton is, and I should say Yana is a freelance journalist um, in Moscow now. She's she's returned. Uh, ben Dalton is a fellow at the Future Frontlines program at New America, um, and has done a lot of interesting work researching. Um, What's happening in the, in this space and Telegram, uh, among other things, and Ben also has a, a very uh, extensive background in, in Russian studies. In, in addition to the subject, um, but I'll, I'll let the kind of biographical details come out in, in the conversation, and, and you all can sort of introduce yourselves. But Taisia, I wanted to start with you. Um, if you could just sort of step back and tell us a little bit about Kolod Media, the work that you do. Um, and, and then also kind of how that fits into uh, the, the pretty complex um, landscape of Russian media and, and online uh, information sources that, you know, if, if we paint a picture of what that looked like on the eve of this um, special military operation, if we're going to call it that, um, in, you know, in, in quotation marks, but because I think sometimes, and we were talking a, a little bit about this uh, before we came online, uh, Americans might not appreciate the complexity of the sort of Russian information media landscape of recent years. Um, I think we have we have sort of a, a caricature notion of what it must have been like during this in the Soviet times. Um, which, and actually, I say caricature might have been pretty accurate. Um, and then we have we know what you know our full blown version of, of of Western democratic media ecosystems look like. And I think sometimes people don't appreciate the nuance of uh, Russia didn't have like a firewall in the same way that China has on its internet. Um, you know, the Russian public was pretty connected to a lot of information. Uh, you know, that was uh, coming from global sources and the, some of the tech giants, but obviously a very 
uh, controlled state media as well. And then a lot of, you know, what, what looked like really interesting experiment, experiments like Medusa and, and other in forms of independent media. So if you could just talk a little bit about the, the tensions there in a, in a, in a country that um, might not have been sort of the totalitarian states of old, but heavily authoritarian and, uh, you know, so just introduce yourself in terms of, of your work and, and just maybe kind of explain this landscape a little bit for those of us on the, who might not be as familiar with the situation in Russia. Yeah, uh, my name is Taisha Dikulatova. I'm a chief editor of Holod magazine uh, based in uh, Russia. Um, uh, I started it uh, on uh, like two years ago and uh, initially we were a storytelling magazine. Um, we focused on uh, mostly true crime stories uh, from different uh, Russian regions. Um, and uh, that was our like uh, know-how uh, because uh, there are not a lot of uh, media outlets in Russia who do uh, this work uh, because it's uh, like um, expensive uh, to send uh, journalists to yeah. different uh, places, yeah, and find stories uh, that are like unique uh, in some way. Uh, so uh, that was uh, our work. Uh, and uh, it was uh, pretty successful uh, because uh, people uh, like stories, you know, they want to read some unique stories. Uh, and uh, people in Russia, they um, um, often do not know uh, much about their own country uh, because they are so. Uh, Russia is so big, uh, you can uh, sometimes uh, only guess what is happening uh, in other regions. So um, we uh, did that work and um, uh, collected uh, like some uh, people who uh, enjoy our stories and uh, love them. Uh, so uh, that was like uh, what we did. and. Um, then a war started, so it was uh, unexpected for us. We didn't believe it, and um, it was uh, like shock uh, when we uh, woke up and uh, saw news about uh, Russia bombing Ukraine. Uh, it was uh, terrible, and the um, thing is that we didn't have uh, news on our website before. Um, the war and um, back then it was uh, our concept that we do uh, slow journalism not news uh, but uh, when it all started uh, we um, realized that people really need uh, a lot of information about what's going on and uh, not a lot of uh, media outlets that can uh, do this job uh, and tell people uh, about reality, because uh, we have uh, a lot of propaganda uh, media outlets uh, in our country, and uh, most uh, of uh, most of uh, publications are controlled by uh, state. So uh, people uh, don't get uh, true information. Uh, so uh, we thought that we uh, must do news, and uh, we started. Uh, news like uh, on that day uh, and uh, we were working for like 24 hours a day since then uh, so um, that's what we're trying to do right now uh, to give people uh, more uh, information about what's going on because um, after the war started um, uh, a heavy censorship begin, began mm -hmm. uh, because um, uh, we don't have uh, freedom of speech in Russia, but uh, it wasn't like that uh, before war. Uh, and now we have uh, like dozens of media outlets uh, which are blocked or um, they just closed uh, because they can't uh, keep going on like that because of a law on fakes, um, which is uh, mm, focused on journalists uh, who uh, want to call uh, war 
actually war, not right. a special operation. Uh, so um, some media outlets just uh, decided to close uh, and to stop working because they can't uh, risk it uh, because journalists can be put in jail because of it. And some of them uh, decided, uh, not much uh, of them, uh, decided to leave uh, the country to keep going and uh, keep uh, telling the truth. So we are one of these uh, media outlets. Uh, we needed uh, to leave the country. We didn't want to, but uh, that was only one option. Uh, and uh, uh, we evacuated our people, our correspondents and editors from Russia. And now we don't have people in Russia because it's too dangerous for them. Uh, they can be put in jail for 15 years just uh, for calling for war, war right so, and it's, i mean it's remarkable this this law was enacted last friday right um i mean i realized yeah. there was already censorship happening but this very draconian new law went into effect that has even given pause to uh western publications i think the new york times i saw had decided to to pull people out um yeah. So, so it's quite remarkable. Now, if it can can readers in Russia still access your your stories, or is 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 your yes, they can off? because so we are uh, like uh, maybe we are just one or just few media outlets uh, which are not blocked yet uh, by okay. uh, Russian state, but we can be any moment. So. Uh, we told our readers that they need to install uh, VPN uh, and uh, okay. maybe we'll create some mirror website when we are blocked. But uh, at least now, uh, readers can access us okay. easily. So just, just, just to give us a flavor um, of the type of journalism that you're doing, if, if I went to your site now, I mean, what, what are some of the stories that I, that I might see that might be very different from what's coming from uh, the state TV in, in Russia. Yeah, uh, we did uh, true crime stories most back then uh, before war, but uh, now we are focusing on uh, what is going on in Ukraine and okay. in Russia actually. Uh, and some stories that we published are uh, focused on people fleeing Ukraine and uh, people fleeing Russia because uh, it's like, um, Two processes going on uh, at the one moment. Uh, people from Ukraine are going somewhere else because they can be bombed uh, or something like that. And people from Russia are leaving the country because they don't want to uh, go to war with Ukra Ukraine. Right. Uh, and they are afraid that where they uh, will be made uh, to go there. And uh, actually, it's more about uh, men because uh, young mm -hmm. men uh, don't want to fight with Ukraine at all. Uh, and uh, it's about uh, uh, independent journalists at, and activists who are afraid for being uh, jailed. So there are two leaving the country and um, there are thousands and thousands of them. Uh, so yeah, we are focusing on the, those problems and um, there, are, there are a lot of them uh, because mm -hmm. when war started, uh, a lot of social issues came out uh, because uh, it's uh, not only about bombs, uh, uh, it's all, also about uh, poor people which will be more poor uh, in coming years. And, right. uh, it's uh, about people who still are coming out uh, to the streets in Moscow, uh, despite that they can be uh, beaten up. Uh, and uh, we had a story about girls um, who were uh, detained after protests in Moscow, and they were uh, beaten up in a police station. And uh, a police officers uh, treated uh, them uh, like they were some animals. Uh, it was uh, like uh, beaten up and uh, calling names and uh, like uh, uh, trying to. Uh, they were mostly women in that police station, so they're trying to 
uh, tried to humiliate them uh, using some terms and calling names and so on. Uh, and uh, that audio, audio tape uh, came out, that, which uh, were made by one of the uh, girls. And uh, it's, it's horrific. It's terrible to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, uh, we are uh, focusing on uh, people who are suffering from this war. And uh, it's about Ukrainian people. And it's about also Russian people because uh, Putin is bombing Ukraine, but he also is beating up his own uh, people right. in his own country. Right. Um, thank you, Jan. Jana, let me let me let me ask let me shift to you and ask you. Um, you know, kind of building on on what Taisia was saying. Um, you know, there, there's this very courageous type of journalism that, that's still being done under incredibly um, difficult circumstances. Um, there are, I, I imagine, you know, international sources of information that are available. Uh, so there are a lot of people who, you know, and, and maybe more educated, more kind of globally connected people in large cities who might, you know, be very familiar with uh, and comfortable using VPNs and are active on Telegram. I mean, there, there are a lot of people who can find this information, um, but give us a sense of, of uh, you know, how, how deep this, this kind of breaks through. Because on the other hand, you know, I think, again, for those of us outside of Russia, we're probably, we probably have a hard time understanding how pervasive and uh, the, and maybe effective. I don't know. You you tell you tell me the 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 official story is that's coming down from from the authorities and that's on my my TV and my radio. And so if I'm a uh, a high school teacher uh, or you know a, a, a businessman and I I, I uh, you know sell electric equipment in a regular sized Russian city and I'm not you know 24 seven online trying to to seek out information from from outside, um, you know who's kind of winning this contest of of you know to define what's fake news, right? And 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 what and what the official you know the story is. On the on the other hand, if I'm one of these, uh, you know, people in Russia, uh, as, as Taisia referred to, are are hurting tremendously. I mean, the the uh, this type of war seemed like unfathomable a couple of weeks ago. But the reaction to it, in terms of the sanctions um, and uh, and sort of the economic uh, uh, coordination among Western countries and reaction, has been pretty breathtaking too. And so I'm very mindful that you know what's happening to the ruble, what's happening to people's savings, um, the pulling out of all these Western uh, brands. You know, we all heard about McDonald's and Coca-Cola, and and now suddenly you know Russia can't even compete to play in the in the World Cup. And that's a signal, I, I suppose, to people about perhaps the judgment that's being uh, rendered on this stuff by by people on the outside. But again, if I'm getting a different message from the government, like just talk a little bit about how you see this this contest and your sense of, of whether um, the, the courageous journalism that's happening that's independent can, can break through this sort of uh, strong government controlled media. Yeah, yeah, sure. First of all, I wanted to say that I didn't know that uh, Taisia and um, all the whole stuff evacuated. That's um, that explains their fearless coverage because me and my friends, we were wondering how come they're so fearless. Uh, and many people really uh, read Holot now and they're sharing posts on Instagram from them. Um, talking about uh, other uh, news sources, uh, there have been a lot of uh, state propaganda here and now it is uh, even more dominating uh, because um, there are less and less sources of information, independent sources and people who probably were lazy uh, or just didn't want to know this other side of propaganda uh, now have even less options uh, to know this side. And um, of course, Russian government wins in this situation uh, because now they can um, broadcast uh, their official position from everywhere. Um, I watched 
state TV a couple of days ago. I forced myself to do this because it is kind of a torture and uh, because of the amount of propaganda there. And it is surprising every time you watch this. Um, their cre creativity surprises you. So, um, for example, we have our first channel. It is uh, one of the major uh, state propaganda channels. And um, just to give the context, uh, all TV is um, state sponsored in Russia. So we don't have any mm -hmm. independent uh, TV channels. And uh, this is the most popular source of information for Russians, especially for Russians who live in regions, in rural areas. Um, so um, they would broadcast uh, Putin lives um, probably like 10 minutes long uh, without uh, cutting anything. Uh, him saying that uh, everything is going according to a plan. Uh, though like this plan was never revealed to the public. So at any point you can say that uh, this <laughs> was the plan. Right. Uh, then they would uh, not mention uh, any um, disadvantages of sanctions um, and uh, how Russians suffer from, from them, them, but they would uh, tell that uh, Western world, Europe uh, suffers more uh, from uh, sanctions that they imposed um, rather, rather than Russians. Uh, they would uh, not cover any protests against military operation, but they would cover uh, some uh, demonstrations supporting Putin. Uh, and um, I guess these demonstrations, uh, they really take place, but they are probably quite staged and people are, uh, are get paid for this. And those people wo work for states. So they're, um, I guess they are forced to organize some kind of kind of these demonstrations in support of Russian uh, military. Um, yeah, and they would say that refugees are not grateful. They require swimming pools and free restaurant food. So yeah, and nothing critical about uh, situations in which Russians are uh, appears yeah. now. And, and I guess it might be hard to gauge, but do you think that that those messages are effective and that people are? Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think that um, the situation probably revealed a lot, even for me and for many of my friends uh, who are liberal and progressive. And because we also live in quite a bubble on our Facebook and we think that uh, people are against the military operation and uh, nobody wants like shelling of this residential buildings uh, and people dying. Um, how anybody can um, be willing to, to kill somebody um, like who is probably your relative here because uh, Russia and Ukraine uh, have so many ties. Right. But um, then uh, you would go even on Instagram uh, and you would think that people there are progressive, but there would be so many hate comments and comments who support uh, Putin and this operation. And it it um, it seems that they are brainwashed because they repeat all the arguments they show on TV. Like th the most popular argument, um, they would tell you, "Well, when were you eight years ago when uh, Ukraine uh, started to bomb Donbas? Why uh, were you not worried about those people uh, mm -hmm. who were killed? And why you?" Um, shouting now uh, that war is something uh, bad. Yeah, well, and, and we, we're certainly familiar with that phenomenon of of having your own particular bubble on, on social media and, and then being surprised or stunned that there's there's there are other worlds out there. Um, and, and Ben, maybe this kind of ties into uh, the work that, that you do and that your program at New America does. Um, as you're listening to all of this, you know, what, what, what are some of your reactions and, and what do you think are some of the things that we ought to keep an eye on um, in the coming sort of weeks and months in terms of how this informational contest, if we can call it that, might play out? Yeah, so I work with um, Candice Rondon, the Future Frontlines program, which really 
focuses on the intersection of technology and basically like information war, which is what we're talking about. And um, we we really focus on a relatively narrow slice of the Russian media ecosystem, which is um, Telegram channels and VK groups, and, and in particular those that are associated with these uh, Russian mercenary groups. Um, people have likely heard of the, the Wagner group, which is really more so than a single entity. It's a collection or a network of, of you know, private military contingents that have been a big part of Russia's military strategy uh, for, for years now. And you know, these groups played a key role back when war broke out in 2014. Um, they would create these sort of like homegrown impromptu social channels where they would post things like, you know, there are actual atrocities that they were committing. Um, and in the years since then, they've evolved into to quite large, pretty like professionally run um, essentially media sources where they, they push out, um, a, you know, pro, pro war propaganda, essentially. And part of why I think it's worth looking at these is because a lot of the narratives that we're hearing pop up on, on Russian state media seem to get kind of incubated here. Um, and, you know, oftentimes I will see a narrative uh, and particularly one that, that you can, on Telegram, you can see which posts get the most engagement um, or the most impressions. The ones that are that are more popular often pop up shortly thereafter on more sort of official media. So yeah, I thought I could just sort of talk about some of the um, sort of hot narratives of the moment that we're seeing on these channels, uh, which I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more of in, in the you know, days to come. Um, so the first is just the basically excusing away or explaining away uh, very evident war crimes or crimes against humanity by arguing either that, you know, actually they were, it was a strike on fascists like the Azov Battalion or, or, or alternately that the images that we're seeing are like crisis actors, that they're people who were fabricated uh, by the Ukrainian side. And this is very reminiscent of what we saw throughout Syria, where basically any time that there was a strike on um, civilian infrastructure, uh, it was explained as, uh, you know, there were jihadis hiding there. Um, we're seeing a lot of rumblings about um, WMDs in Ukraine, so a lot of chatter about, um, you know, the presence of, of, of you know, U.S. Uh, bioweapons facilities mm -hmm. um, as a way of sort of like, you know, retroactively justifying the invasion. Um, one big narrative I'm seeing just in the last three, four days is that Ukraine is like deliberately forcing civilians to stay in harm's way as a way of inflating and inflicting uh, civilian casualties. So, you know, if there is a strike, you know, and this is particularly around Mariupol uh, in the south of Ukraine, which is essentially surrounded by uh, Russian forces. And um, you know, there's, they're arguing that, you know, Ukrainians are not allowing them out of the city. Um, and so therefore it is their fault once Russia then proceeds to, to shell the city. Um, there's a really disturbing trend of like fake fact checks. Um, and this uh, reminds me a lot of back in 2016, um, once, you know, there was about, there was a media started using this phrase fake news and about like half a second later, Donald Trump just sort of like appropriated it and used it for his own purposes. So this is like a way of copying what uh, like Oakland source researchers have been doing for a long time on this conflict of, right. you know, saying this or that image is decontextualized. It's, you know, from years earlier, it's from an entirely different country in some cases. And now you see a lot of that happening on, on the Russian side as well. So, and, so I'm, glad you, I'm glad you bring up the fact checking and because, because this is, the and we're all, we're all familiar with this debate in the states too about the you know we um, these the tech platforms um, uh, you know they're they're they take it from both sides if they do too much moderate you know uh, moderate content moderation if they do too little and it sort of kind of depends who they're moderating and 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 who's being you know flagged for for um, misinformation and most platforms kind of stepped up a little bit during the uh during covid uh because they you know there was sort of a consensus that okay um the hands-off um approach maybe uh has a higher cost when you're talking about people's health and uh, and obviously around the, the last couple of election cycles so when you when you when you migrate th this these kind of difficult trade-offs um that the twitters and youtubes of the, and facebook's of the world face into this Russian context now, 
obviously it's it's it, the 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 stakes are even higher, um, and and the the difficulties that these platforms often face is they're trying to have universal standards, um, and you know uh, what's what fast one of the things that fascinates me in the in the context of Russia, and I'm curious what the three of you think about this is. Um, you know, Facebook has now been blocked, right? As of last week, I, I take it. Um, uh, and there's there's been a lot of criticism of, of YouTube, which apparently has huge audiences in, in Russia and, and the way in which they might kind of just echo some of the state media. Um, but I also see um, like Zelensky in the Ukraine, in Ukraine asking um, a lot of these US and other Western tech companies to pull out, you know, as a way to sanction Russia in the same way that, you know, there was pressure on McDonald's and Coca-Cola to pull out. And I wonder what you all think about, um, is it preferable for the Twitter and, and Instagram? Uh, I mean, again, Meta has Facebook, which has been blocked, but apparently people can still access Instagram and WhatsApp. Um, but is it is it, should we think about these, um, these companies that are in the communication business as some somehow distinct from uh, the Coca Colas and McDonald's in, in other in that like maybe it's better. Um, there, there's something interesting about both Putin and Zelensky wanting to take them out of Russia for different reasons, right? I think in Zelensky's mind, it's it's a sanction, just like nobody should be doing business with Russia. But on the other hand, you know. Putin agrees with Zelensky on that, if nothing else, because he doesn't want this, you know, these potentially more independent sources of information. Um, so that's just something that kind of I've, I've been wrestling with. Um, Thaisi, I don't know, and, and, and Ben, I mean, Jana, all of you, I'm just curious how you sort of re react to this understanding that, you know, these platforms, which are very easy to second guess what they do, they're just also navigating really tough uh, trade-offs, right? I think uh, it would be a terrible measure uh, to make Twitter and Facebook and all these companies leave Russia because uh, it's not about uh, giving people uh, like food or, or I don't know, clothes. Uh, it's about giving people information and access to free information. And uh, it would be even worse if they uh, left Russia and uh, people will be I just uh, left without uh, any uh, access uh, to independent media uh, and uh, independent uh, uh, like sources uh, and uh, people won't be able to express themselves on a like a more or less safe platform uh, and uh, I don't think uh, it's it is uh, some uh, measure against Putin at all because uh, Putin wants them uh, to leave uh maybe even more than Zelensky so I don't think it's a proper thing to do mm -hmm. yeah and uh, I can also add that uh, independent media outlets like Colors Media are uh, getting uh, most of their readers from social platforms like Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and if uh, we are left uh, without these platforms then our readers are left without these platforms uh, it would be uh, much uh, more difficult for them uh, to get uh, information from uh, media outlets like us. So I don't think it's a good thing to do. Ben mentioned VK groups. Um, and I just want to make sure like that doesn't get lost in, in the, that's that's uh, contact here, right? It's a uh, the it's, it's a it. I mean, maybe describe that. Um, it, it's sort of like the Russian analog to to Twitter. Is that well, it started as a essentially an almost direct Facebook clone um, many years ago, but has kind of evolved into its own thing. Um, and it, unlike Telegram, which has adopted like a pretty significant like broadcasting role almost, like you know there are public channels that people will monitor for like cutting edge news, a little bit like Twitter, I guess, in some ways. Um, VK seems to incubate more sort of like a, a, a closer, more intimate community, I would say. But, you know, I, I would defer to, to, to Yana and to Tasia uh, for more of the sort of nuances of how it works within the Russian social media ecosystem. Oh, 
well, uh, I can say that, for example, Facebook uh, has more uh, users that are pro-Western and uh, that uh, probably like Western culture and they are more liberal. And in VK, uh, people are pro-Russian. Uh, there are more patriotic people there. And uh, I know that now um, they have a lot of groups uh, that support Russian military in Ukraine. At VK. So, so it isn't necessarily that the, or maybe there's some differences in terms of like the censoring of the platform, but you're, I think you're suggesting there's also like a certain amount of self-selection that occurs in terms of the people who sign up for the different um, platforms, right? Is that? Yeah, I can also add that VK is uh, um, actually dangerous for people who use it. Uh, who use it because uh, they uh, are state controlled and they uh, give uh, uh, out people who like uh, posted something on VK and they uh, give all the information about the person to the state so that that person okay. will be uh, prosecuted uh, on it. I see. So, so it's, yeah, I mean, that that's, that's the ideal type of social media for, um, the regime in the sense that it is yeah. it, it's fully under its control. And, and that, that's why these uh, having these offshore international platforms can be inconvenient. And I know even prior to this conflict, there was, there's been a longstanding effort on the part of the government to have the Twitters and Facebooks have more of a physical presence in Russia to, to be able to have exert that, that pressure. Um, in terms of, um, you know, we were talking about what's dangerous to people and you know in in times like this people are, are courageous in different ways and but also assess risk in different ways and one of the things anecdotally that that, that has struck me just watching this from from the us um far far away um but being old enough to have um you know remembered uh watching the soviet union from far away is you know we we have uh i've watched U.S. newscasts, like broadcast TV newscasts, like NBC Nightly News um, in Moscow. And again, this is changing in recent days. But once, you know, between the time that the conflict started on February 24th and the uh, the law passing last Friday, there was still, you know, th th this nightly newscast was reporting from Moscow and they were in someone's kitchen in Moscow and they had uh, a woman and her young child and the Russian woman was telling the American reporter, this war is crazy, Putin should stop it. And again, this is not this in a million years, you never would have seen this um, in the Soviet days. Like there was no TV correspondence getting into someone's home and someone feeling comfortable speaking out against the regime, right? Um, and again, this is a fast changing stories and a lots of people are being arrested protesting this. And so I now I wanna talk a little bit about kind of how, how is that playing out? I know that, um, you know, Taisia, I think you launched a, a, a social a campaign of, about the I'm not silent uh, campaign that Yana wrote for about for Future Tense. Uh, thank you, Yana. Um, but, you know, we've talked about the courage of, of journalists, but talk a little bit about the ability of people to uh, continue to, to organize and, and engage in these types of protests and, and how that, um, you know, how that is kind of unfolding um, as we speak and how that might change or not. Um, you know, I think it's very easy sitting in the States to feel like, well, people should come together and, and put a stop to this and, you know, the regime shouldn't get away with it uh, if everybody went out into the street. Um, but that, you know, easier said than done and very easy to say from across the ocean, but give us a sense of, of that dynamic there. Um, yeah, actually I'm really impressed by people who are still uh, coming out uh, to protest against uh, this war because uh, uh, it has been, uh, it has been a, like heavy assortive uh, state uh, in Russia. Uh, authoritarian, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, now you can easily call it uh, dictatorship, I think, because it's uh, like uh, unfolding very, very fast. And um, people are really risking their health 
and their lives uh, coming out because they can be easily put in jail. And uh, there are a lot of evidence how um, uh, people were uh, treated uh, in uh, Russian police stations. It's terrible. And, mm -hmm. uh, it, and uh, a lot of people are still coming out and uh, it's, it's really impressive. And a lot of these people are very young and uh, a lot of them are women. Uh, and uh, the kind of, uh, it's like unusual. Uh, and uh, when this war started, a lot of people who were like, I'm not like uh, into politics, they finally realized that the politics came uh, into their houses. Right. And it's like a moral catastrophe, uh, catastrophe uh, going on. And uh, they, they don't want to be silent uh, anymore. But uh, 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 anyway, uh, they're not very, uh, like, uh, there are not uh, a lot of people who are uh, fearless enough to come out because uh, I don't think uh, there are enough of, uh, uh, like, uh, independent uh, people who think independently to even try to change the regime and uh, to try to uh, like uh, win uh, um, because uh, you can't expect uh, people to like uh, um, stop Putin with their bare hands because right. uh, they are not uh, like uh, they don't have anything to stop him just their mind and uh, they are like uh, uh, they can fight. They are like intelligent people who just uh, are uh, coming out on the streets uh, to feel uh, uh, like uh, they did something to stop it, but they can't actually do it. So I think uh, people need to understand that there's uh, Russians who are coming out. It's okay, they are fearless and they are great and it's very impressive what they are doing but they can't stop putin and you can't expect them to stop putin so that's all i want to say mm -hmm. yeah no we had a we had a question from someone in the audience um related to this uh asking if 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 you feel um that you put yourself in danger even by doing things like participating in in this conversation with us it's a question that puts you on the spot, I know. <laughs> but. Well, um, I think I feel a little bit in danger, uh, but um, every time I feel this, uh, I'm asking myself uh, what illegal activity I'm doing. I'm just sharing what I see here, what I witness, and uh, how can I be punished for this? And if I am just used to live uh, with my hands uh, tight and my mouth shut. What life is this? So I'm try to continue uh, my normal life. And you, you have. Uh, uh, so, so I'm cu I'm curious, just in terms of like you, you referenced your 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 bubble, um, and you know I'm sure you have a lot of. A lot of people you've worked with and 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 friends um, have a similar worldview to to yours, as as is true for all of us. Um, but uh, I'm just wondering how overlapping these bubbles might be. Do you have? Um, uh, you know, I'm thinking back to conversations with like progressive friends in in the states who might say like, I didn't know anybody. I don't know anybody who voted for Trump. Or or you might have like the the reverse, right? So do you have like relatives who are cheering on the denazification of Ukraine and, and have a completely different view on this than uh, any, anything we might be reading, you know, outside of, of Russia? Or is that kind of bubble just so far removed from, from yours? Like how, how much do people like have different worldviews on this coming into contact with each other on an everyday basis. 
Thankfully, my family is uh, all against their uh, military operation, but I know there are a lot of cases when there are fights inside families okay. right now and between friends. And uh, I was very surprised to uh, find even one subscriber on one on my Instagram who supports uh, military operation. And I yeah, um, caught myself um, getting really upset and angry with this and I was like really a little bit ashamed by my reaction because um there was I was at the Did someone you went to school with or um to the driving school and uh <laughs> yes but she uh, is a student um in her 20s at one of the most liberal universities in Russia high school of economics so I didn't expect something like this from her and um yeah and i was at the protest and i uh, posted uh videos from the protest but protests here now look just like peaceful work uh people do not chant they do not uh carry any banners uh for their own safety and even these do not uh help them and um she wrote to me oh so is it really a protest yeah, and that's, that really made me uh, frustrated and I talked back and I was not proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes it's hard to hold back. Um, ben, we had a, a, another question because um, I do want to be mindful of, there was a, a, could you speak, a question from the audience, could you speak a bit more about the role of uh, Wagner slash PMCs in the battle for information dominance? On, on social media. Um, you uh, you talked a little bit about this before, but um, could you speak a little bit more? And, and as you said, like some, some in some ways, the, these have been sort of the leading indicators, right? Of like the, the larger themes that then get taken up by by social media. I mean, do, do you talk a little bit about, more about that, but also as, as you look, look ahead, um, do you see any way in which the, you know, as much as, the Kremlin is trying to assert more and more control, and uh, you know there's already a lot of pulling out by other other voices. Um, but do you see any uh, scenarios where the the official control over the messaging might might be weakened, um, despite what we're seeing? Or if you had to kind of play this out, or, I realize this is very speculative, but yeah. Well, so it's true like these these uh these pmc social channels um really seem to play an outsized role in spreading messaging especially relative to their actual numbers on the battlefield right so like we've heard reports of uh wagner affiliated groups uh you know a few days ago uh the ukrainian government posted um a dog tag um from from uh one of these groups uh, hunting down Zelensky in, in Kyiv, uh, participating in some of the fighting around uh, Kharkiv. Um, but in terms of absolute numbers of people on, on like the battlefield, it's, it's, you know, a fraction of the, you know, the regular Russian forces who are in the country. Right. But despite that, like, you know, they have very consciously built a mystique around themselves. Um, and it, it's to some extent become like a popular cultural movement where, you know, you can buy t-shirts or mugs, um, you know, and, the, the Telegram channel that is probably most closely associated with, with Wagner has you know, hundreds of thousands of, of, of subscribers. So it's you know, um, a significant uh, portion, I think, of, of how Russian speaking people are getting their news about this conflict. Um, I, I love, I have to, I love how I can only see the little ears, Taisia. Um, <laughs> speaking of information wars, uh, you might have to introduce. I'm sorry, sorry if you love that. attention. I know. I'm I'm very jealous. I wish I had a cat. But Ben, sorry, go on. <laughs> oh, sure. Well, as far as the, the other thing that you mentioned of, you know, any hope of like breaking this open a little bit or signs of like the Kremlin losing control, I, I don't really see that, if anything. So like, you know, part of what we've heard in this conversation is, you know, there was Russian state media television, which is honestly has been dominant. You know, that's how a large majority of, of Russians uh, get their news. There's there were these like small and influential and very important um, independent media, Echo of Moscow, uh, TV Rain, um, Nova Gazeta Medusa, things like that. 
um, which are essential, but uh, were relatively small compared to, to the media mm -hmm. impact. And then there was social media, uh, which despite the Russian internet being one of the most surveilled in the world for years, you know, there weren't, it seemed like there weren't necessarily, people didn't have to fear repercussions um, just for like commenting, you know, their, their opinion. But now you're hearing reports of like ramping up people being paid to sort of like, you know, report uh, dissenting opinions, even in like social media channels. So no, I, if anything, I see it all militating in the in the direction of more and more and more control. And a question for all of you: Do you think that um, some of the this these changes, um, including the one that you just mentioned, Ben, about like the 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 shrinking of of space for independent thought and and expression online and that had sort of generally been my impression and and there are there are you know not a small number of countries where the the governments are mostly preoccupied with the old kind of broadcast right the the, the mass media um and and often state controlled you know tv and radio that is as you point out you know going to be the the primary source of information for 90 plus percentage of the population and if there's going to be some you know small elite bubble you know where yana inhabits that you know <laughs> where you know people can 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 have independent thought if it's if it's a a, a publication a magazine that's going to be read by you know maybe tens of thousands of people and it's social media for people very globally connected. Like maybe, you know, my regime isn't going to be that obsessed over controlling that because I really, what I care about is what 98% of the people are going to be um, digesting. And so in a weird way, there's like this, these two coexisting spheres. I, I think that's not, um, there, there are probably quite a number of, quite a few countries we could point to where that is sort of the situation um, and, and perhaps Russia had had been one of those. Um, that's now rapidly changing. And it turns out that, um, no, we're going to exert control and be vigilant um, across all media, even if it's just a, a few thousand, you know, cosmopolitan people that we thought before could, could not really do much, you know, amount to much um, collectively. Um, if... God willing, the situation um, comes to an end, the conflict comes to an end, and there's some resolution um, in the short term. Taisia, do you think that, you know, do, do you imagine that six months from now, you know, things could be back to the normal of 2019, 2020, which again was not ideal, and I realized um, uh, it was far from, from ideal, and it was a very difficult environment for people who wanted to do serious, hard-hitting journalism. But the normal where, you know, I average Russian citizen might be able to go online and and say whatever I want and access stuff that perhaps people in China can't. Right. There wasn't this all pervasive firewall. Or do you think that as a result of this moment and this these changing laws that even if the conflict gets resolved, it's things are going to be very different permanently and perhaps more like the control of information in China than in some of these more hybrid authoritarian regimes? You know, I, I won't be surprised if uh, internet in Russia will be shut down. Uh, I don't think that uh, it can be like uh, changed in six months or even maybe six years. I don't know. Uh, because uh, these things, uh, they were happening uh, long before this war started. And okay. uh, people, uh, you said, uh, uh, get back to the times, to the times when people can uh, like go to the internet and write or whatever they want. But um, that time are long. Uh, uh, we don't, we didn't have that opportunity for like uh, maybe ten or more years. Like uh, they started to put people in jail for like reports or tweet, tweets or like something like that uh, long before this war. And okay. uh, there is uh, a man uh, from a um, demonstration uh, in Moscow who is currently in jail for five years for just uh, uh, posting uh, one tweet, one tweet about um, policemen or some, something like that. And uh, I don't think uh, it will be uh, uh, like uh, 
uh, back to normal ever again with this regime? Uh, I don't think so. I think uh, what is happening now is uh, um, is a problem for Putin too because uh, people are not happy with what, with what is going on. Okay, there are a lot of people who still support him, but uh, they will uh, uh, think about what's going on uh, because uh, they will see that uh, uh, not only they are left without like uh, Western brands and uh, uh, like uh, more stable ruble or, or something like that, but they also will see that uh, uh, this army, uh, which was supposed uh, to get uh, into Kiev like for five days, uh, didn't manage to do it. And uh, we see like um, videotapes from Ukraine where uh, Russian soldiers who uh, got nothing to eat or or just uh, they seem uh, like uh, not happy at all. And uh, this is not the army that people were expecting to see. Right. Even, if they, even if they are Putin supporters, uh, they thought we can like uh, win and uh, we will be like strong country, uh, strong imperialistic regime, but uh, what they can see now if they uh, will be uh, a bit uh, hungry for information, they can see that the Russian army is not as strong uh, as uh, we were told, uh, because we were told uh, all these years that uh, our army is the strongest uh, in the world, and we have like uh, everything that we need to uh, to even uh, win a war with the USA if it will be happening. But right. now we see that uh, it, it was uh, not true. So, I mean, uh, Putin supporters, uh, they uh, will see one way or another that uh, this all were lies. Uh, it will be too late, of course, uh, because uh, uh, something terrible already happened and we can't just stop it but uh, they will see so uh, that's what's going on yeah no, that's interesting and and, you... uh, i mean i mean that uh, if uh, putin don't have uh, uh, that uh, if uh, putin will see that his support is uh, getting uh, uh, less and less and uh, he will need to control media more and more because right. uh, if uh, something independent uh, comes out, uh, uh, it will be not uh, good for him. So he will need to create a picture of himself for public. Yeah, yeah. Jana, you get the final word. Anything you want to add or react to that? I wish that uh, Taisia was true, but I don't know. Um, I just see that everything is getting worse and worse, and uh, I'm um, getting disappointed, I think, in, in um, Russians as well. And I think that our population um, is used to tolerate everything. And I'm afraid that even seeing prices um, go up and all these consequences, they will still justify the violence and uh, they will still uh, repeat what they see on TV because Taisia now says that um, those like things about Russian army, but what I saw from those reports on TV, they uh, take, uh, for example, uh, the interview of an American expert uh, on um, at Fox News who uh, probably like the only American who told that Russian army is successful and everything is according to plan. And uh, so they uh, broadcast this and people believe this uh, and they, I hope that uh, they will understand something, but right now I don't see any signs. Yeah. Well, as both of you were talking about that and how people interpret uh, how the campaign is going, of course, there's there's a, 
uh, precedent in terms of you know the war in Afghanistan, um, different era, but similarly, you know, at a certain point, you can't uh, totally um, uh, obscure the fact when that things might not be going according to to plan. I mean, you can only pretend that the plan was <laughs> to not you know succeed for so long, right? Um, and in that context, I mean, the, the legitimacy and the credibility of, of the then Soviet era government was very much questioned. But of course, that took that took years. It's the, you know we're we're week three. Um, but the, and it's it's not it's still nothing. There's no optimistic scenario here in that you know that the the amount of suffering and tragedy involved in in that tra transforming of. Uh, public opinion, uh, the cost is is just horrendous. But um, this has been a heavy subject. It's a heavy moment. Um, but hopefully that will there'll be more surprises down the the line that that might be positive. But for now, I, I just want to really thank the three of you for taking the time and and sharing your your thoughts and wisdom and and for all the great work that you're doing. And thank you to all of uh, the people who connected with us. And uh, we'll we'll keep keep an eye on, on the situation and, and keep reading all of you. And, and just thanks a lot for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.